We are going to start a recording. So go ahead, Caitlin. She's asking about whether Socrates should have run away. Okay, so like I said, I think it was conflicting because it's hard to like stay and allow for like the corrupt system to just like not listen to him because I don't think he was guilty, but I it I don't feel like it was fair. But also <laughs> like in running away, like that's also conflicting because like where would he go? Like his children, and as in like one person can't fix the system. So it's kind of like, like you can inspire other people to go and try and fix the system. But overall, I feel like it would be kind of just causing more trouble to run away. But also, I wouldn't want to allow the corrupt system to just rule. So. Right. What, what do his political enemies say if he runs away? Caitlin. Um, I mean, I guess they would say, like, maybe he's just trying to create more problems, and then they would take it out on his children and his family, and it would just make situations for, like, other people who were around him worse. Right. Okay, well, he was going to take his family with him, and then his friends were going to his friends were going to get in trouble. But yeah. they, they said, that's okay. We're willing to be heroes, right? Um, yeah. So I can't remember what I was saying. Let's see. Oh, yeah. His enemies would say, if he ran away, his enemies, see, he's a lawbreaker. We're right, right? Yeah. But if he stays, what do his enemies say? That. He was guilty. Yeah, see, his. he's admitting it. He was guilty. <laughs> yeah, he's admitting it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, catch 22. Um, there are people for political reasons who will do that to other people, right? But that's not democracy anymore. Those are people that just want power, right? Does that make sense? So as soon as it gets to that point, where an honest person is is absolutely stuck, the the power hungry will find ways to label them, mislabel them, and mislead the public. So I don't know. Never happens here, right? You should be careful. <laughs> and I want you to figure out. You you. I hope you find some situation in your life where you actually spoke out, right? And you can identify with Socrates. Every one of you has exhibited moral courage in some way, I'm sure. And then think about, did people label you? Did people mislabel you? Did people use you for their own political purposes? Um, did they interpret what you did in a way that was to their advantage? I don't know. The more you can see analogies between what he's doing and something in your life, because everybody was, you know, to some degree gets in situations like that. Um, all right. Who else? Let's see. Jason. Um, we're, we're still on the topic of whether he should escape right mm -hmm. um i think i think it's it's a lose lose kind of thing um like you said if he runs away and it, like, oh yeah he did break the law but if he stays they're gonna accuse him falsely accuse him anyways so um i don't in this situation i don't think there's um i don't think there was anywhere for him to anything for him to do that would like pretty much put him on top because like I'm, mean, you basically just explained everything what I, I was thinking about. Like it's, it's a lose lose. However you look at it, I don't think he. There is no way for him to. I guess you could say, um, get justice, um, stop the, the corruption, and any anything he could have done on him. Yeah, it's it was a lose lose. Either way you look at it, I think it's a lose lose. Because, uh, um, yeah, I mean he was falsely accused and and 
I, I don't know if you've ever heard of a story where anybody's falsely accused gets their justice. Probably they do, but as like later on down the road, maybe they're already, you know, six feet under and they, have, um, how do you say it? What is it? Um, exonerated. Yeah, you're exonerated, right. But yeah, I have I mean, some articles. I had some right. news articles about that, yeah. At that point, you know, what's the, I mean, yeah, you're exonerated, but you're already six feet under. And if you run, um, I mean, that's not helping your case either. They're gonna, like you said, the label, you, oh, he did break, you know, break the law. And you're always like, I guess you could say like, looking over your shoulder to see if your enemies are still chasing you. And it's not helping your children either. Um, like you said, you know, it'd be the talk of the town, oh, your dad did this, your dad did that. So it was a lose-lose, if you ask me. So, I mean, what Plato's trying to show you is you don't get yourself in that situation, right? If you have a democracy, don't corrupt it. It just, right? Downward spiral. All these people get in all these horrible situations. Completely. Right. Un- yeah, go ahead. But like, you, you said like, is a democracy don't corrupt it, but isn't that like, I want to say like the whole point is to corrupt, but like, isn't it the whole point to like speak your mind kind of thing, right? Because we all vote on things and this and that. That's, yeah, that's not corrupt. Cor- to corrupt is accuse somebody, right? Right. Accuse? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, okay. Um, Titus, what do you think? I think it's really a matter of perspective based on present and future. Like if you're thinking in that moment, then yes, he was falsely accused. So he should escape because he shouldn't have even been there in the first place. He should be there because he have kids that he needs to be a father to. But if you think about it in the future, you realize that's really the better play because I think for one, it's always honorable to die for your cause, especially if you know it's something right. And also, you know that the people who follow you, they're going to know what happened. They're going to know why you did what you did. And it'll be further motivation for them to kind of carry your legacy. So, and that's what Plato did. And I'm not sure if that's exactly what his kids did as well. But it's basically how it happened with any political leader that caused some sort of revolution for their cause. So overall, I think it was right that he stayed and died. Yeah, Martin Luther King's uh, kids, uh, at least two of them, I think three of them are pretty outspoken. They're pretty involved in civil rights issues. Um, okay, Mary, Mary Hannah. Um, I agree with Titus. I do think that he should have stayed. Um, but more so for the fact of his kids, like he talked about how they had more opportunity um, in Athens. And but then I thought about how he basically left them to Crito, uh, I don't know how to say his name. But um, and like, so basically they get to fill in their head what they want. Like he said at one point something about how he wants to be remembered as someone who like went down, not for like a bad reason. I don't know how to explain what, what he said. I'll have to find that exact quote, but basically um, however his legacy is remembered is whatever impact I feel like it's going to make on his kids. And that kind of determines whether he did the right thing by staying or escaping. It's hard to know. You just have to trust family and friend, right? You have you depend on other people. Um, so Plato tried to make it so that Socrates' legacy, right, the legacy would get passed on. But but you sh- you would not believe how some scholars interpret Socrates. So just like Jesus, right? You know that they interpret Jesus differently. So it's the same. Um, Michael. Um, so I have two like main thoughts. Um, so one is that like he clearly supported the Athenian democracy. Uh, him staying kind of shows his loyalty to that democracy and the law. Um, so like in staying true to his own beliefs, I think him not escaping was the best option for him. Um, 
and I think that had he left, the people who uh, were kind of his, you know, band of followers um, would have thought him to kind of be a hypocrite of, you know, the things that he was he was saying. Um, and then I also noted that if he did escape, it would also make him look guilty, which we already discussed uh, whether or not he was. Um, and then I also said that um, one of his main goals kind of also seemed to educate others um, about um, about like true Athenian democracy and how it was you know supposed to be uh, critical thinking etc. Um, and so like with him being dead, um, his impact may not have been as great as if he was alive. Um, however, we ob obviously see Plato continue um, with his ideas and, you know, his impact was pretty great, um, maybe because of the fact that he died. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe martyrdom, right? You don't right. know. Right. Um, and then as far as the best and worst argument, so I thought the best argument was the children um, that Credo uh, brought forth because I feel like a lot of Credo's other arguments were kind of like selfish. I, I said his worst would be the thing about losing a friend or <laughs> that he was too cheap to get too cheap to get him out because I think the, the one about losing a friend was not really genuine and I think it was actually more of a way for Credo to start the conversation before moving on to his more like selfish and egotistical nature um, and how like him not freeing Socrates uh, would affect his appearance to the public. Um, and then I also, sorry, one of the things I wrote down was that like he, he chose to leave, I guess he didn't have a lot of options, but he did choose to leave his kids to, to Credo, right? And like we, we talked about Credo um, and like how he was pretty selfish and egotistical. Um, so I just don't know how, you know, I don't know how his children turned out, obviously, um, but I don't know. Uh, that he, I think what he met was Crito was his patron, right? Like the kids were going to depend economically on Crito. Um, let's hope that Crito wasn't the only one who is going to be able to tell the, his kids about the meaning of their dad's life, right? Right. Um, and I think that was all I had, but I did kind of want to go because Jason said something about um, like how uh, like corruption um, and how like, you know, democracy could in some ways um, lead to that. And I kind of felt like that was kind of a true statement, not in this, not in this specific example, but like um, when you do have free thought um, made from like the freedom of democracy, I feel like that can lead to certain corruptions based on like perspective of what is right and what is wrong. Um, which kind of moves on to like morals and ethics. Um, so I don't, I don't know. Okay. Um, Mary Hannah raised her hand. Um, in the middle of that, I remembered that we were supposed to say um, which reasons we agreed and didn't agree with. But then Michael said the ones that I was going to say anyway. So, okay. Um, so Zach. Um. No, like I don't I don't think he should have escaped just because like what Jason said like it was just a lose-lose situation for him like he can't really go anywhere because like like he said if he went to Athens he'd just be sent back if he went to Thess Thessaly? Thessaly Thessaly yeah um they'd tell his kids that he was a lawbreaker um and, like They'd be poor, more poor role models for his kids, um, and then like the he said, uh, Credo said, well, uh, "You're playing into the hands of the enemies if you stay," and um, also kind of a lose lose because like if he stays, he deserves it. If he runs away, then like he's a hypocrite and a lawbreaker. Um, and then also, like, I don't think he wanted to drag his friends into it because he's because Credo said, like, as your friends, like, we're willing to get in trouble for you. And then Socrates was like, well, no, because, like, we'll all be considered hypocrites and self centered and not very responsible. And I just don't think he wanted to drag them into it with him. So, okay. So what would happen if one of you 
I'll say a guy, right? Because the, the probabilities, okay, gets accused of rape, right? And of raping somebody. This happens, right? Online campus, happens on college campuses all the time. Uh, when my son was in college, somebody in his fraternity got accused and people said to him, oh, you sig abs are all but your races, right? Uh, guilt by association. Um, but what if you, you know, your friend tells you this is not true, right? So you think the friend is falsely accused. The, the female is wealthy and her wealthy dad is going to get a really good lawyer. So you're going to lose. And it's going to like ruin your future. It'd be really hard to get a job, right? You're going you're gonna to have this terrible uh, black mark on your future. Uh, what do you do? You're going to run away? Are your friends going to say, uh, I can get you, you know, like run away would be go underground, get whole different identity, you know, get so, or else go to some other country, right? Well, if you go to Europe, you're gonna get caught. And if you go to some other place, right? You're in this remote place uh, and you live out the rest of your life in some, you know, totally alienated, right? From all friends, family, culture, everything. Um, and some of your parent, uh, your friends think they're heroes for letting, for having you escape. And other people think, you know, whatever. Well, what are you gonna do? I mean, I guess you would try to fight it, but those odds nowadays, if it's just a girl saying that and it's come to court, then your odds aren't that great anyways. Yeah, well, so we argue about this, right? I mean, it's people argue. I, I just have to give you a sense that this is about you, right? This isn't some remote thing that any of you could get unjustly accused of anything at any point in time. Uh, because you happen to be, you happen to look like the person and, and some witness misidentified you, right? But the person with the lawyer is rich and they get a rich lawyer who can actually win any case, right? And so that, I mean, same thing happened in Athens. Um, so my main point is that you have skin in the game for keeping your system honest, just you personally. But I mean, to me, it matters more that if, if I'm white, it's a lot less likely, but why should it be more that much more likely if you're black or brown, right? And that's wrong, right? And I don't want my system to work like that. And so, you know, you speak out and you definitely talk to people and try to get people to realize racism is systemic. It's connected to class. Everything is interconnected and we need to change the system. <laughs> or we're just gonna have more and more of these things and it's not democratic. And either we're gonna try to fix it or we're gonna polarize on it. And when we polarize on it, it just gets worse. The legal system gets worse. So you, not to decide is to decide. If you ignore it and do nothing, it'll get worse, guaranteed, right? People have to be working on it. Doesn't mean you have to, throw your life away, but you have to be engaged. That's, that's the punchline. Um, all right, so let me go over a few of these outlines. Um, we have another 10 minutes. Well, okay, so the next thing was the news articles. Let me see, I had um, the apology and we will talk more about comparing it. Uh, yeah, the Persians and the, and the uh, British, but Socrates and Jesus, right? We are going to compare that. Um, that's, I think, the next, actually, the next class. Now, how many of you read of campaigns and breakfast cereals? It was assigned, right? But what did he say? The selling of the president. 
there was no issue. Okay, this was the first time that voters, that uh, political operatives decided that people really don't want to think and you should just, the goal was to sell a product, not to explore issues. Okay, um, let's see. There was no issue when it came to selling Ford automobiles. There was only the product, the competition and the advertising. He saw no reason why politics should be any different, right? You, you guys have to understand this. I mean, this has even become normalized. So you just talk about, well, the Republicans need to work on their brand. It has nothing to do with their policies, right? So there's a book about policy and, it, it argues that Republicans ha don't have policy recommendations. They just know how to win elections. Now that, you know, I don't, I don't wanna just pick on one political party. This book is called Imposters, but you do need to find out what is the Republican policy? What are their policies? And do they create a middle class? And what are the Democrats' policies? And do those lead to a middle class? Do you care about a middle class? <laughs> if you don't, anyway, I mean, I'll, I'm just gonna take the Aristotelian point of view and you can decide you don't agree with it. But his view is that if you don't have a middle class, you don't have a democracy. You can call it anything you want, but it's not. And so political leaders should be held accountable for doing what they can to create a middle class. So if, if you don't think that's the goal, that's fine. But if you do, you need to find out, right? Which party has which policies and do they promote a middle class or not? But I do think you should definitely read this article. It's right, it's uh, because voters are basically lazy. Um, in other words, we're a nation of nitwits and a presidential campaign at a critical moment in world history will be spoon fed to us like an ad for Wheaties. Voters are basically lazy, uninterested in making an effort to understand what we're talking about. Okay, you guys, I think the situation just keeps getting worse. This was back in Nixon, right? This is way back quoting for Richard Nixon. So yeah, as a, you know, the whole thing about Plato is this was how they lost their democracy, right? People weren't informed and they were suckers for rhetoric. So in this other, here's one about we have time to do everything but think. And of course, Socrates would agree with that. And then the interesting thing is that it's a few months before 9-11. And that's why I pick older articles, because I want you to see that you're stepping into history at a certain point. And I, the his, you know, history says it's only gotten worse since then. That's, and, and you know, history is being written, but you are writing history, right? You are writing your generation's history. So, okay, this is one where all this stuff I think is really important. This is where a guy, um, committed a crime, but all of his friends and supporters are, and he, and he escapes, right? They're, they're uh, supporting him and they're breaking the law. You know, they won't tell the police where he is because um, I think it was, he, yeah, he bombed an abortion clinic, right? Or uh, he, he bombed a gay nightclub in Atlanta and abortion clinics, right? So if you agree abortion is bad, is that okay to protect somebody that bombs them? Um, and then here, so the idea is that does anybody care about the rule of law, right? So that's what I want you to think about. Do Americans care about the rule of law? Do you care about the rule of law? And what happens when people don't care about the rule of law? You lose your democracy. Um, so, so let's see, I have four minutes. Um, 
So the wrap up here is that Athens had a great democracy, Athens lost it. And it was all these, it was just the climate of opinion, right? What were people thinking? And then, and that is very fluid. It can change really quickly. And it did change really quickly after 9-11. So I want you to realize now that you're in college, you need to be constantly examining and re-examining yourself and develop insights about practical wisdom. And if you do that, you'll get better at it. And then you'll start realizing that we just keep reinventing the wheel. We just keep making these same mistakes because everybody forgets, <laughs> right? From the last time. So like my dad um, at age 19 was uh, Pearl Harbor, but World War II, he's in high school. My dad's in high school, World War II. The Treaty of Versailles is signed. It's a punitive treaty. His history teacher says to him, well, we're going to have another war, you know, like revenge doesn't work. Hello. <laughs> the Athenians tried to, to take revenge and the Spartans came back and they lost. So, but just because, just because people don't learn from, doesn't mean they, they can't, right? Plato's telling you, you can learn from his history and you're responsible if you don't, right? You're no longer ignorant. You can't plead ignorance. You have to take responsibility. And, you know, if you read Plato's dialogues, you can't even be naive. Here's how we lost it in 30 years. One generation and we lost it. You can lose it. Don't take it lightly. Michael? Um, yeah, so one of the things that I noticed uh, when I was reading through this stuff is that... Um, everything that we're reading is, you know, Plato's perspective of what was going on, what was happening to Socrates, because Socrates didn't actually record anything, um, I think is what I was reading. Um, so I was curious, like, obviously, Plato believed in what Socrates was saying, but are there, I mean, are there accounts of people who did not? Um, and how do those differ? And how do you, um, or we say that, you know, Plato's, um, his perspectives are the right one? Okay, so what I think Plato did is he made Socrates into a mythological character, a type of person. So like the historical Socrates might, obviously these conversations didn't play out exactly the way, right? This is not a journalist. Um, so the historical Socrates might have ups and downs. So he's made him into the ideal citizen right? Does that make sense? So, and that's the way Aristotle, that's the whole Greek poetic tradition, is that you use historical figures in order to convince people that it's possible, but then you mythologize them. You just pick out the kind of person they were and the kind of thing they would say in this kind of situation. Does that make sense, Michael? Yeah, um... But I feel like in, in that perspective, we're most of the time only getting the good. Um, That's right. So Plato is actually, what happened was in Greek tragedy, even the best characters make mistakes, but the Athenians were not learning any of the lessons. So I think Plato decided to write dialogues where it's clear that there's one person that represents the light of reason in the dialogue, but that doesn't mean that particular Socrates always got it right. What it means is this, Plato is saying, this is my idea of the good. This is my idea of what it would mean to live the perfect life, even though nobody does. But does that make sense, Michael? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because if you get too caught up in history, of course, everything's ambiguous, but if you don't know where you're going, you're sure not going to get there, right? So, you know, he's just saying, well, here's where I think people should go. This is what I think they should aim for. And then that it's in light of that, that we can 
evaluate ourselves according to whether we think we made a mistake on this or that. That's, that's what he's getting at. And that's a good question because what happens is ever since the modern world, people are obsessed with facts and they're obsessed with history. And if you just obsessed with details, you can't learn any lessons because you know everything's different. Um, so in dialectical thinking, you take Socrates as a pattern and then you do similarity and difference, right? So somebody else is unjustly accused, I don't know, last week in Minnesota or something. And you go, well, what's similar and what's different? Okay, and that's, it's just a touchstone for historical events so that you can make some sense out of them. But there's certain events that are accidental and there's certain events that are just fundamentally different. And you could say it's not analogous, but that's where you just talk about it and you just talk it through. And that's how you develop your capacity for wisdom. Um, that's a good question. Anybody else? I apologize for not recording it, please. Interrupt me right away. My students at Asia University have learned to do that. And almost every day they have to do it. Um, it's just because my mind, I'm, I'm just not thinking about things like that, you know, thinking about teaching. So for the, for the essay uh, over the weekend, um, do you give us a prompt and will we get that tomorrow or? It's all posted right now. Okay. And it's just called paper topics. Okay. All right. And I, yeah, so you can check it. That's the nice thing about using an old, uh, my last summers is that it's all there. Um, okay, any other questions? All right, we'll see you tomorrow. We're we'll due Aristotle's virtues. And I wrote on it kind of specifically what I was looking. I, I revised the announcement a little bit so that I think it'll work. Okay, bye-bye. All right. Oh, mm -mm. stop recording.